Hi, hi, hi. Hello, everyone. How are you? How's it going? Soothing intro. It is. It's soothing. I'm never seem to be, you know, together. <laughs> I don't know. Um, hello to you and my hello, hope cooking dinner, taking care of my peeps, so I'll be listening, but won't be able to watch chat. Okay, alrighty, yeah, just take a listen, um, do what you gotta do. Um, hi, Jeffrey, how are you? Hello, Johnny, you'll be right back. Okie dokie, sounds good. <laughs> Here's Johnny. <laughs> ah, that's weird uh, for me to say it. <laughs> Actually, I would say it even more weird if I wasn't on here. Hello, Sleuth Mom. How are you? How's your day going? How's everybody? How are we doing, everyone? I hope that you've all had a good day and um, the day has treated you well. People have been kind to you. All is All is good is what I'm hoping. That's what I'm hoping for. So we do have more documents on, um, we have more documents for James Brenner, uh, that we'll get to that are for, um, the government motioned for protective order to be put in place for literally anything and everything surrounding, uh, James Brenner weapons trial. Um, so I will read that and, uh, it's not long. It's not going to be like crazy long. It's, um, four pages, uh, for one thing that I'm reading and then like two and a half pages on the other part of the, um, protective order that I'm reading. So it won't be crazy long. That one be, is order granting motion for protective order. Order granting motion for protective order. Um, <clears throat> so I'll read that. And then um, a couple of articles that I want to read as well. Um, but yes. So let me see. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. So um, I did talk about it yesterday. Just a quick update on Aiden Fucci. If you follow his... Um, his case, or really, it's Tristan's case. Um, my cats just scared themselves, but that's okay here. Um, the defense motion uh, by Aiden Fucci's attorney include requests for a gag order, and I can bring you over for some of the skimming of. Of I don't want to. I don't think I want to read the full um, full thing. Um, so. New defense motions uh, filed by attorneys for Aiden Fucci include a request for a gag order on witnesses, which seeks to prevent them to speaking to, right, speaks them from speaking to anyone but lawyers in the case. See, guys, you could see for yourself, I'm not always the one making the mistakes. Sometimes I really am correcting their mistake because they write it and I'm like, wait, what? Let me say it correct. Uh, and then a lot of the time, it really is me. Um, other motions include a request that the state produce any evidence that could impeach witness credibility and that the judge block the state from presenting closing arguments that would prejudice the defendant. All are common pretrial motions. Additionally, attorneys for local news outlets, including this this channel, WJXT News for Jax, have filed a motion to intervene in the case specifically to contest the previous defense motion to close the pretrial process to the media and to bar cameras from jury selection. Yeah, they want to close everything up. They basically want to do a like a Daybell, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell situation and just lock everything right up. So um, this news channel that I'm reading from, along with other media, uh, are they have put in to try to go against that and say like um hold up here like wait a second don't we have a right to be able to hear some of it right um so fuji is charged with first degree murder in the death of tristan bailey she was found dead may 9th of 2021 fuji her schoolmate was arrested in the early morning hours the day after bailey's body was found 
in Durban Crossing, less than a half mile from Fucci's home. Investigators said that his DNA was found on Bailey's body. Fucci's next court date has been set for August 31st. I don't know. Let me look and see if I have that one written just to be sure. I might not have that written, so I will save this. Yes, it's playtime for the animals. If you just heard jingle bells, it's the kitties. Um, so I'll hold on to that, but that's kind of what's happening is a whole lot of motions are happening right now. Um, attorney for accused murderer in Fuji seek to muzzle witnesses, right? Basically the same thing is what we just read. Lawyers for St. John's County and accused of stabbing Tristan daily to death want to block witnesses from discussing the case. Um, a new filing in the first degree murder case against a St. John's County teen seeks to muzzle potential witnesses in the case. Um, attorney for Aiden, which would make sense, right? I mean, if you're going to be a witness, you shouldn't, right, be talking to everybody. Um, not really, right? You're not, you're not supposed to. So that's normal. It's a normal thing. Um, attorneys, but the kicking everybody out, right? And wanting no cameras and no media. And, you know, that's probably a pretty, pretty normal thing that they try to request, but it's not really something. Again, it's the Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell have approved every ceiling of everything. This is distracting me down here. This video is very distracting. Oh, you're not on the same page as me. There is a woman climbing. Is it a woman or a man? A man. He put in an order at a drive-thru. And here, come over. I'll show you. Unless it's gone by the time we get back. Oh, and I'll expand you guys so that you're on a bigger screen. He put in an order at a drive-thru. I don't have the volume up. This right here. He put in this order at this drive-thru. And then when they went to walk away, the window went to shut. And... So on June 18th at approximately 7.50 a.m., commercial robbery took place at the Wendy's located on 5500 block Major Boulevard. The suspect, a man, Nissan Altima, wearing a light gray b -b 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 skirt, straw hat, shorts, water, can't see what that says, presented a handgun to an employee, climbed into the drive through window, and stole the cash drawer. So that's what we're about to witness then. Because I saw him not allow the door to shut to the drive through window. And then climb out his window of his car to go into the window of the drive through I don't know if there'll be sign, sound on it or not. But it... I saw him start climbing out of his car and into her window and it distracted me really badly. I was like what is happening here? That would be so scary. I'd be like take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. She's like you're at the wrong one. And he's like oh I'm just figuring out how to rob you. Awful. See? He puts it in park. He even made sure that his silly little straw hat was coming with him too. He was like, we're going to keep this big oversized straw hat on my head while I get out of my vehicle and go into theirs. We want to make sure this hat goes with me. He's probably trying to block his face from the camera. I'm assuming is what he's trying to do. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, you could kind of get his face when he turned and he looked to see if they were coming. I mean, it kind of there for a second. Um... But outside of that, not really. Get that off my screen. Right there. No, that's dark. You can't see anything there. Wow. His straw hat worked. He wanted to make sure he kept that with him. That's insane. Good grief. 
Holy moly. I don't know. I didn't see. Did you see a gun? I guess I'm not paying attention. To a gun. He must have shown her the gun before and said walk away. It, or something. Because I don't see any gun. Okay. Anyway, back on topic. Uh, so that was that for Aiden Pucci. Um, and then next update. Uh, it was bold. Ex drive through worker? I'm thinking so too. Because I'm like, I would be familiar. But I don't think that like anybody in my life that's never been in in a drive through uh, worked in a drive through scenario before would be fully familiar with that type of setup. And I mean, that's still even risky. He had to have, I guess, held the gun or something and said, unlock it. Because... How did he know that that drawer would have even been unlocked to get that out? Crazy stuff happening, right? How are you today, Charlotte? How are you? Hi, B Tim. Too bad that she didn't steal napkins and straws, too. Yeah, did you um, see somebody that has gotten angry before and they've reached in and they've grabbed the cup because they were mad and they wanted it to get water and then they ended up getting angry so they ended up knocking over all of the cups all of the napkin holders and shaking all the napkins out everywhere flipping over everything everything on the countertops all of it flipping everything all because they wanted a cup and i think they wanted a cup of ice or a cup of water and um they were told that it was going to be charged <laughs> and they didn't like that and so yeah there was a situation with a fit i mean and then you got the girl that did the she twerked herself out of the store did she throw a fit like that too right wasn't she also throwing stuff um i think what did she do i don't remember what her i forget what hers was about but she twerked out of the mcdonald's I'm good. Thank you for asking. She did that too, right? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, see, okay. It's pretty common for people to like... <laughs> yeah, we'll take this. I'm going to destroy all these cups. It's like... Holy moly. Can you imagine the tantrums that they threw for their parents? It makes you wonder. Like, I guess my parents never gave in to my tantrum. And so I wonder if they're the ones that the parents used to pick them up when they would start to tantrum. The parent would pick them up and coddle them. And so they always got their way. I, it makes me wonder. I don't know. Like, it makes my brain try to see, like, how, do, how does it form an adult human based off of your, your way of being raised as a child, right? How does it form you into an adult and your reaction where you're throwing a full size adult human fit oh it's insane to me especially when you start getting actual weapons involved so you're taking people's lives then i have a big problem with it and then i have a huge problem right <clears throat> but when they they've got nothing to do but to grab the cups and napkins and right it's insane so this one is just a, it's a quick, a few second video, a uh, 16 count indictment for accused killer. Um, the store owners and the grandson. Um, this was something I touched base on probably about a month ago now. They, there had been a shooting um, inside of, they had, they had killed somebody, but what they had done is stolen, they killed they stole the weapons that they killed from from their own uh is this the same one hang on uh gun store owner accused killer of the gun store owners and their grandson okay so this guy came in and he killed the owners and the grandson uh f with their own gun he had previously robbed them had robbed the gun store and it was a shooting range and he came in it's 23 seconds he came in and he, he he murdered them um and he used to come to the range and he ended up going there and murdering them 
and it was all guns when they ended up going to his house they found apparently what did they say there's 16 count indictment i mean they found multiple multiple weapons uh, that were all stolen and they had all been stolen from the very place of the people that he killed yeah hold on this might want to be refreshed she's she's thinking far too hard about that we'll refresh it does he new for you at 11 a new 16 count indictment just dropped against a man accused of killing three people at a Coweta county gun store in april 21 year old jacob muse is facing several charges including murder assault and armed robbery authorities arrested muse about a week after the killings and police say he frequently visited the lock stock and barrel gun store He's accused of killing the owners, Tommy and Evelyn Hawk, and their grandson, Luke, before stealing from the store. We are seeing more cases of monkey pie. Isn't that terrible? Holy moly. This is always out of cups. It never occurred to me to tantrum. <laughs> Good. Good. I'm glad. Uh, they got her order wrong. And... She was getting it for free, but she was mad and then smashed the cups and stuff and then proceeded to twerk her butt off. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's her. That's her. That's her. That's her. Yes. Wait, wasn't she pregnant too, maybe? Am I just adding things to this? Why do I feel like she... I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. Somebody asked me for an update about how she's turning out how, how things are working out for her um and i haven't looked into it but maybe i should um <laughs> i don't know her name i i can only look her up by a girl that twerked out of mcdonald's <laughs> okay so we have a recycling plant worker you guys this one's really ugh. wait hold on what do you guys what do i have you on let me just confirm that this is not yeah okay so let me put you on to the one that i'm over here at this one's bad um i'm going to put up a banner that just says trigger warning right that i may discuss stuff that's uh disgusting and shocking ish you know um and so just be advised of that please <clears throat> so Recycling plant worker missing since May. He fell into the plastic shredder and his remains were found under the machine. According to the coroner. How terrible is that? Ugh. Human remains found under a plastic shredder at a South Carolina... Yeah, ask uh, Carol Baskin about it. She'll probably have a, an idea. She probably did something along those kinds of lines to her husband her yeah but anyway that's besides the point human remains found under a plastic shredder at a south carolina recyc recycling plant belong to a man missing since may according to coroners who announced on wednesday that the man had fallen into the machine and died according to the state spartanburg county coroner rusty clave Cl i don't know who he said that tissue Dried blood and small pieces of human body matter uh, belong to Duncan Alexander Burrell Gordon, 20. Oh, it's only 20. Who vanished in early May from industrial recovery and recycling in Greer. Gordon was working at the shredder where the human remains were found on June 14th. Four days after coroner investigators were contacted about his disappearance. Wait, four days before? Oh, June 14th. Four days after that, the coroner investigators were contacted about his disappearance. It is unclear why it took weeks for the coroner office to get involved. However, the state reported that before the coroner made the discovery, the machine was checked by Gordon's father, who is a supervisor at the plant, and a uniformed patrol supervisor with Spartanburg County Police. That's weird. 
According to the reports, sheriff's detectives and canine cadaver dogs discovered the remains under the convoyer, con convoyer, con conveyor, <laughs> don't worry, I'll get it out, the conveyor belt during the, the third search. So, that's interesting. The coroner's office also located human matter under a support that is located under a conveyor belt that transports plastics to another machine for additional processing. Huh. The material was desiccated, so it was hydrated. I don't know if that's what uh, hydrated in a lab later. Uh, he explained in a statement issued to WYFF, after hydration, it tested positive for human blood. Gordon is believed to have been working on top of the shredder when he vanished. The, ro the room that the shredder is located in is noisy as it houses other machines, which presumably explain why nobody heard him fall. Golly. The coroner's office elicited the help of forensic anthropologist and forensic pathologist who determined that 60,000 pounds of plastics had been processed through the machine since Gordon's disappearance on May 5th. Quote, I ask you to also consider that the missing man weighed between 210 and 250 pounds. What was recovered by the detective may be approximately two ounces of human remains. He explained. The human remains were tested before the coroner's office was contacted on June 10th. A DNA profile confirmed it matched that of Gordon's parents. OSHA is investigating whether any work safety violation had occurred at the recycling plant. The probe is expected to take eight weeks. Meanwhile, he explained that he cannot file a death certificate for Gordon as his body was not intact. What? However... The state has other methods which will allow Gordon's family to formally establish his death. Did you guys know that? Did I know that? I don't know if I knew that. I, I don't know if I knew that. Hi, Granny. Grandma Sherry. Whew. I made it. I made it. I was really concerned because I said it so quickly. I was like, what if I say it really quick? quick and fast will I get away with it I got away with it because I got two phones to sit here and one day my other phone picked it up and caught me when I said your name and it said my name back to me and I was like excuse me that was really rude I didn't even know this thing knew my name it's not even my main phone um so I was like that's strange just throwing names out there so, we succeeded another day. How are you? <laughs> hey, HRC, how are you? Did I see you come in? I don't think I did. I think you blended. And there's lots of purple today. Lots of purple. Sleuth and Charlotte and B Tim. And then Hope is purple. And then HRC is purple. And then... um. I'm going to go with grandma because I don't dare say it again and get caught. Um, you all are purple or lavender. Uh, so that's really sad for this guy. Um, this is his picture. That's really sad. I wonder if they're supposed to wear a safety harness. And I also wonder if I knew that if your body's not intact, that you're not able to get a death certificate. I don't know that I knew that information. That's interesting. Uh, Zion Foster. I don't know if everybody is familiar with her case. I'm going to drop a link and leave it with you if you want to go through it. It basically discusses... Um, let me bring you over and show you real quick. It's a quick... Oh, my cat's got, got something to say. Sissy's got something to say. In the voice that I don't like what she uses. Yeah, I, I, da, da, da. So this, just a quick, this is, this is a very small little 
window for us to see in, but this is Zion right here. She is the one that went out with her cousin one night. He came back and she did not. And he lied to the investigators and to Zion's mom. It said he didn't know where she was and he didn't know what happened. And then he got charged with lying to the police. And it's because he said he did know what happened. But th I believe the story that he's telling is a lie. Um, and I, I think it's a lie. He says that they were smoking weed together. And that she fell asleep and he walked away and went to the bathroom I think he said I don't know but he walked away and when he came back she was not breathing anymore and so he freaked out didn't know what to do and so he picked her up and he took her to the dumpster and he put her body in the dump right yeah her cousin her cousin did that to her and so they're currently searching a landfill right now um, as we speak. Uh, it's been seven months since 17-year-old Zion Foster left her home, East Point, back in January, while her cous cousin Jalen Brazer was sentenced to four years in prison for lying to police. Her body has never been found. Earlier this year, he admitted to putting her body in a dumpster, which led to the launch of Operation Justice for Zion. Crews have spent the last five weeks searching for Foster's body in a Macomb County landfill. In a new edition of the Daily J podcast, WWJ's Zach Clark examines what lengths police are willing to go to find Zion. And then this is it right here. It's a 10 minute, but not really, because the beginning is ads and the end is kind of addy too. So it's really not that long. Um, but I'm going to drop that if you have an interest to play it um, a little later or, or whenever uh, you will have it. Uh, it basically just discusses a lot of what we already know. But in it, you get to hear um, some footage from the mother and the, of Zion. And she is sobbing and stating, like, how could you just throw my baby away like she was trash? How could you just throw her away? And what if, what if... She said, what if you were so high that you didn't know that she was breathing? What if she was breathing, but you were too high? And then you put her in a dumpster, which when they take the dump, they crush the trash. You, My baby got crushed in the process of this. How could you allow that as her cousin? And then lie to me. And not, you know, say that you don't know where she is. And so, yeah, that's what this is about. Um, but I, I found that I figured I would pass it along to you. Um, and then this one, you guys, wow. Uh, trigger warning, if they do show the face of the man, um, a mental health therapist went over to a man's house, right? I was going to tell you guys about this yesterday. Um. He went over, she went over to a man's house for therapy. The man ended up holding her captive and, and then ultimately hostage, um, like hostage situation where once the police did show up, he then dragged her through the home and put a knife to her throat and told her he would slit her throat if she said anything, if she made any noise. He had already brutalized her during the 15 hours that he had her the the session got over and she went to leave and he threw her into a bear hug and prevented her from being able to walk out the door and took her phone wrapped it in aluminum foil wrapped it up in duct tape um and then that way there wouldn't be any anything that would be able to ping right um, and he, he raped her and did just awful, he beat her. Um, well, they, the law enforcement had to shoot him because he put her in harm's way. 
so law enforcement did end up pulling the trigger and they they shot him he survived there is the, the image of him if they show it he looks rather rough they've got like the front half of his head is shaved but not the back but his eye is all swollen and he looks rough right so uh just a, a heads up if they show it i don't want it to scare you guys well, gruesome details emerging tonight in the hostage situation where deputies say they were forced to shoot the assailant in the head. The man accused of holding a social worker hostage and terrorizing her, he remains in custody. WPTV's Matt Sesney has new shocking information on the ordeal of the woman trapped in a suburban book with own home. The arrest report spells out what could only be called a house of horrors. For 15 hours, a 25-year-old woman says she was held hostage in the home physically beaten and sexually assaulted. When deputies burst into the home, they say they found Svi Alswang in the master closet, holding his victim with a knife to her throat. When he refused to drop the knife, a deputy shot Alswang in the forehead, but he survived. This morning, he showed up in front of a judge facing charges of attempted murder, kidnapping, and sexual battery with force. A woman told detectives she was at the home on Larkspur Trail as a social worker trying to help Alswang find a job. The report also says Alswang physically attacked the woman, duct taping her hands together and repeatedly assaulting and torturing her. Family and co-workers of the woman feared for her safety as early as Friday night and contacted law enforcement. PBSO entered the home just after 9.30 Saturday when a single shot to the head brought Alswang down and ended the ordeal. The woman, traumatized and injured, is now hospitalized. A family spokesman says they are not commenting, and neither is Svi Alswing's attorney. In West Palm Beach, Matt Sesney, WPTV, News Channel 5. We're a month into hurricane season, but we all know that the media... Well, gruesome details emerging tonight in the hostage situation. So they end up playing that same video. Okay, but um, this one says that um, <clears throat> that's not it. Deputies arrived at the home at 6.30 Saturday. This says p.m. I thought the other one said a.m. Uh, July 2nd, after receiving a call from a victim's partner requesting a welfare check, Probable cause affidavit, which was obtained, stated that the caller told the cops that the partner had failed to return home from her client's house after their therapy session. When deputies approached the residence, they heard a woman screaming for help and forced their way inside. Um, when deputies entered the master bedroom, they discovered him standing inside a closet with a knife to a woman's throat, according to authorities. Uh, the sergeant shot him once in the head after he refused repeated commands to drop the knife, allowing the hostage to escape. The woman was taken to the hospital in stable condition and treated for injuries to her head and body caused by him, his alleged beating and raping. During an emotional interview with investigators, the woman stated that she had gone to his house last Friday evening to conduct a therapy session. She stated that she was aware of his juvenile sexual battery charge. The victim claimed that at the end of their meeting, he grabbed her around the chest in a bear hug and told her that she couldn't leave. According to the affidavit, he then took the woman's phone and bound her hands behind her back and duct tape. During the course of the night, she pleaded numerous times for him to let her go and he said that he was not going to let her go the court documents read um allegedly he allegedly thrashed the therapist with his hands and knees and raped her multiple times the woman told detectives that she thought that he was going to kill her on several occasions during during while he held her hostage when authorities arrived to the house the victim said that he placed a large kitchen knife against their throat and warned her to be quiet or he would cut her throat 
according to the filing. Uh, he's charged with six felonies, including attempted murder with a weapon, four counts of sexual battery with force, kidnapping. Um, he made initial court appearance Thursday, July 7th, and was ordered held without bond. He's expected to be back before a judge on August 8th. And <clears throat> another one read that the female therapist um, says that he was taken to hospital in critical condition and then transferred to the jail where he remains. The victim was taken to another hospital, treated for injuries, sustained to the head and body after being tortured, beaten, raped during 15-hour ordeal. Um, he His charges are armed false imprisonment and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Uh, the suspect was denied bond in order to have no contact with the victim. And uh, the sergeant who shot the suspect is on paid leave as authorities investigate what took place between the suspect and victim. Yeah. Crazy, right? It's insane. It is insane. Yep. Um, I'm going to put you on this. And then we're going to talk. We're going to read... The search continues for 22-year-old Shreveport woman missing for almost two months now. Police say Savannah Hale was last seen in downtown Shreveport in early May. Her older sister, Kristen, stopped by PTAL today to talk about the search for Savannah. NBC6's Charlie Busico has a story. Kirsten Hill is not giving up on finding her little sister, Savannah. I know my sister. We're best friends, like we've been close forever, our whole lives. And that's, she wouldn't just pick up me. Hale says she got a call from Savannah at 6.08 on the morning of May 4th, but she was asleep at the time. I don't know, I wasn't planning on letting this go to voicemail, but you know, whenever you get a chance, you can, you know, call me up, girl, whatever. Love you, okay, bye. So then I went to her house. Um, and she was not there. Um, boyfriend didn't know where she was. He was drunk and went to sleep and he woke up, she was gone. So she went to the police and reported her sister missing. I'm sad, I feel like enough's not being done and I miss her. Volunteers have searched along the Red River looking for any signs of Savannah. They went down 23 miles, they did 23 miles of Red River. They also searched all of 12 Mile Bayou Friday with sonar. But so far, no sign of Savannah or her car. A silver 2012 Kia Forte. There's times I just want to call her and talk to her, tell her about my day. Um, and I can't. Savannah was last seen on security camera at the Louisiana Tower Park and Garage on Travis Street in downtown Shreveport on May 4th just after 7 a.m. That was eight minutes after she was picked up on surveillance camera at the Chevron on North Market Street. I just want to know she's okay, that's all, and that I love her, that she is loved more than anything. Shirley Busico, NBC6 News. And there's a Facebook group dedicated to bringing her home. Anyone with information on where she may be is asked to call Crime Stoppers at the number on your screen. Yeah, her case really sticks with me a lot. Um, I really want to know more details about her case and know more information because I worry about her. <laughs> like every time I see her, her picture, I worry, um, a lot about that case, a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> we got some paperwork on the crumblies as well. Let me put you on it and then. Wow. All right. Whoa. All right. State of Michigan. 
uh, circuit court. It's a um, notice of hearing. Please take notice. So this is ultimately to the right here. Karen McDonald and Shannon Smith. Those are the attorneys for uh, the Crumblies. Well, this one, this one's the prosecutor. This is the Crumbly, and then this is the Crumbly. Mar, whatever, Mariel, Mariel, Mariel. Um, she and and Smith are the Crumblies. Then the prosecutor is Karen uh, McDonald, and they're trying to get the attention of the defense attorneys that they have court coming up. So there's a hearing, notice of a hearing. Please take notice that the uh, people's motion for clarification of the court's June 27th, 2022 order regarding the defendant, it's their own motion, you guys, the defendant's motion to restrict pretrial publicity will be brought on for hearing on July 13th before the Honorable uh, Cheryl Matthews at 8.30 in the forenoon, so in the morning, in Oakland County Courthouse, right, where it's at, Michigan, as soon thereafter as counsel may be heard. And so, and it was dated on the 6th of July, and then the second one, they put, let me come back to you guys. Here's the second one to be filed with the case management office by 430 on or before Wednesday preceding motion day. Uh, right. And so that would be coming up this week if I'm not got my days all messed up. Right. I don't know. 13th. It's going to be next week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know what day, though. Uh, so <clears throat> it says it's for the people. There's the court, the judge, uh, Matthews. Wednesday. There we go. There's my answer. It's on Wednesday. Um, people's motion for clarification of the court's June 27, 2022 order. And um, the defendant that they have on there is James Crumbly right here. Uh, I have made reasonable and diligent attempts to contact counsel requesting concurrence in the relief sought with this motion on June 30th, 2022. Notice if this motion has been precipice, I don't know that word, with no one appearing that the judge has an option of sanctioning parties or dismissing your motion. Your electronic signature certifies that the above information is correct. And then there's the attorney and phone number, blah, 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 motion. Briefs must be delivered to the judge's chambers or e-filed. So, yeah, they're trying to get the attention of the defense attorneys on their own motion. If that's not bad, I don't know. What it is. <laughs> I mean, what is happening? Right? What is going on? Hey, Johnny, how are you? Welcome back. Welcome back. Not given more opportunities. And why it says uh, such sex offenders must not be given. Right. Because he had another opportunity after he had done it as a juvie. And look at how much more intense it became. Right. Okay. We're going to talk about Molly Miller and Colt Haynes. Is anybody familiar with their case? I know Annabelle is. I don't think Annabelle's here, though, is she? Has Annabelle been here? I don't remember saying hi to her. But I also don't remember a lot of things. So... I don't think she's here, though. She's the one that brought to my attention that Molly was also missing. And so I said, what? Because I put up that Colt Haynes was missing. And... She said that the girlfriend was missing as well. And so I took a dive and, well, I'm going to share that dive with you guys. And I recognize her 
once I saw her, I recognized her. This is Molly. MIA? MIA. Hmm. And no, you don't know it? No? Okay. So, in July of 2013, Molly Miller and Colton, um, or Colt, right, uh, Haynes were passengers in a car chase with police when the driver allegedly turned onto a dead end Oklahoma road. The two have not been seen since. Right? I'll read you this other one because that kind of got me concerned and I was like, what do you mean? 17-year-old Molly Miller and 21-year-old Colt Haynes went out with a friend on the evening of July 8th, 2013. The evening escalated to a high-speed chase with law enforcement and Molly and Colt have never been seen again. Their families desperately seek answers as to their disappearance. If you have any information about the events of the evening... They're asking you to contact law enforcement, right? And I was like, wait, what? A high-speed chase? And I was really confused, right? Like, did he take her? No. No, no, no. They were both passengers. The car Miller and Haynes were riding in was a 2012 Honda Accord, was found totaled two weeks later in a field near the aborted police chase. Oxygen up and investigates, right? So I'm going to skip that a lot of times because it's going to say it a lot of times. Examines the unsolved case on, on Saturday, they did, of uh, March 7th. I don't know of what year, um, but there's going to be stuff on it. So after this, if anybody wants to watch any coverage of it, there will be coverage of it. Um, on a summer night in 2013, a car carrying three people led Oklahoma police on a wild chase. The following day, the driver was accounted for, while his two passengers were never seen again. So what happened? That's a question that the friends and family of Molly Miller and Colt Haynes have ho hoped that law enforcement could find the answer to for nearly seven years. Their bodies have never been recovered, and early investigation efforts were complicated by the fact that the car's driver had close family ties to a powerful local sheriff. This puzzling case is the subject of a new episode of Up and Vanished, the Oxygen Network series based on Payne Lindsay's podcast of the same name. It isn't the first case Lindsay has investigated that's found small town residents hesitant to share what they might know. Season one of his podcast covered the case of missing Georgia woman, uh, Tara Grindstead, a suspect, was eventually arrested for her murder. Lindsay tells, uh, I'm for a mag, I don't know who, that this is often simply due to the tight-knit community's culture. Quote, they're not afraid for their life. They're afraid because they're possibly never going to live anywhere else, Lindsay says. If they're planning on staying and expanding in the same little town, they don't want to ruin their life or their family's life by pointing the finger at a particular person, especially if that person has any type of police ties. So even if they wind up learning something more in terms of the truth, they're trapped into being secretive. In the case of Molly Miller and Colt Haynes, a person of interest connection, interest connection to a prominent and since disgraced sheriff certainly complicated the politics surrounding the investigation. Here's what we know. The mystery begins with a police chase in Wilson, Oklahoma. On July 7th, 2013, 17-year-old Molly Miller and Colt Haynes who was either 21 or 22 years old, per varying reports, were picked up by 21-year-old James Con Nip, known as Con Paula Miller Fielder, a cousin of Miller's, tells Lindsay on Up and Vanished that Miller 
had only met and become friends with Haynes around a week before the event. However, both Miller and Haynes had known Nip for a long time. In fact, Haynes had a son with Nip's ex-girlfriend. Alright, so are we following this? There's a connection there with that. Plus, you've got a family member that's police. Right? Um, per police report citing, cited in Up and Vanished, at around 10.30 p.m., Nip pulled into a convenience store parking lot in Wilson, Oklahoma, with Miller and Haynes in tow. When he spun out of the lot in what's believed to be an effort to incite a police chase, two deputies in a police car took the bait and followed the vehicle. Reaching speeds of 120 miles per hour, Nip resisted the authorities' calls to pull over and headed towards his family's property, crossing from Carter County into neighboring Love County. That's when the deputies halted their pursuit in the vicinity of the dead-end Long Hollow Road. Nip and his passengers continued driving into Love County. Miller and Haynes called friends for help after the chase and dialed 911. Miller's last known location was on Pike Road in Love County. According to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, missing oh, investigations missing persons report phone records show that after the july 7th chase and into the early morning hours of july 8th both miller and haynes made several phone calls to friends asking for a ride and water quote saying they were lost somewhere near oswald road haynes also told friends that he had badly broken his ankle and was lying in a creek bed. His sister, Monique Stewart, told True Crime Daily. At 12.57 a.m. on July 8th, Miller, or someone using Miller's phone, called 911, but dispatchers didn't hear anybody on the line. By 10 a.m. that morning, both Miller and Haynes' phones were unreachable. No one has seen or heard from them since and Miller's family reported her missing on July 8th. And then there is a... I shared this the other day. Whoa. Uh, justice for Molly Miller. And she had blue eyes, brown hair, 5'5", five five, weighing 95 pounds. She had her bottom lip pierced. And her hair was dyed dark when she was last seen. The car in question was found abandoned two weeks later. The car Nip had driven that Sunday night, a 2012 Honda Accord, was recovered in a field near where the police chase had ended. It had $18,000 worth of damages. The car was driven through several barbed wire fences, which did a lot of damage. Police Captain Ronnie Hampton told the Daily armor i don't know that in 2014 quote there was also a lot of damage to the undercarriage from driving through ditches molly miller's disappearance became an official homicide investigation in july 2014 a full year after the events leading up to her disappearance the osbi acknowledged the likelihood that she had been murdered paula miller Fielder told Up and Vanished host Payne Lindsay that she went to Nip's house on September 1st, 2013, desperate for answers. Quote, I asked Khan if Molly and Colt were okay when he left them in the woods. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I never was with Molly and Colt. I didn't leave them in the woods. Fielder recounts. When Fielder told him that the call records records contradicted his story he continued to deny it i spoke to con on september 1st 2013 i went to his house and i asked con if molly and colt were okay when he left them in the woods 
And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I never was with Molly and Trolta. I didn't live with her. And I said, well, Connor, no, you're lying. According to Molly's phone records and the people she spoke to, she told them she was in a police chase with you. You left them in the woods. They didn't know where they were, and they needed a ride. And he just kept denying. I finally said, Connor, no, she's dead. I, I said, I just don't know where she's at. I said, can you please just tell us where she's at? What he said? His eyes were watering up like he was about to cry. And I said, Con, just please, just tell us where she's at. Do you think he murdered Molly? No. But he knows exactly what happened to her. For him to be showing this remorse, he knows what happened. Quote, I finally said, Con, I know she's dead. Fielder continued, claiming this made Nip tear up. I said, please, just tell us where she's at. While Fielder didn't think Nip killed her niece, she believes that, quote, he knows exactly what happened to her. The driver, James Con Nip, is related to the then sheriff of, o of the Oklahoma County where Miller and Haynes disappeared. In 2013, Nip's cousin, Sheriff Joe Russell, had jurisdiction over Love County. Not only did Russell reportedly steer police away from his relative's police chase, according to Up and Vanished, allegedly telling deputies not to pursue him, Miller's family believes that he's hiding information on what actually happened. Russell is no longer Love County Sheriff having resigned in 2016 amid corruption charges for allegedly letting his son deal methamphetamines out of the sheriff's house and harboring a fugitive. Quote, I think when he's actually behind bars and people don't have to fear retaliation from Joe, then I believe hopefully that the right person will come forward, Fielder said in a 2016 press conference. He was not sentenced to time accepting a plea deal for probation instead. And up and vanished, when Lindsay confronted Russell outside of his residence, the former sheriff rebuffed his questions. And so I'm going to play that for you right now. This is Payne that's about to get out and go talk to the used-to-be sheriff who is no longer anymore because, well, he let his son deal methamphetamine and they were housing, uh, they were harboring a fugitive. So he got corruption charges. The plan was to go to his house, Lindsay says, and after a second pass of the property, Lindsay was surprised to see Russell standing outside. Quote, I said, hey, just start rolling, he remembers. I really didn't know how it was going to go at all, but I just had one or two questions in my head that I'd been going over. I was a little taken back that he had the nerve to say he didn't care. The decision to confront him was in part because... In his past experience, quote, it's interesting what can happen when someone outside of the town comes in and starts asking questions. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Nip served four years in prison for his role in the police chase. Police issued an arrest warrant for Nip in 2014, charged with endangering others while eluding the police, assault with a dangerous weapon, an unauthorized use of a vehicle, Nip was sentenced to 10 years and served four. However, he had never been charged in direct connection to Molly Miller and Colt Haynes' disappearance. Theories of what happened to Miller and Haynes, but the police haven't announced any concrete leads. True crime fans continue to pour over the mystery. Murder Squad, the podcast from author Billy Jensen, and former police investigator Paul Holes presented the details of the case in an October 2019 installment, urging listeners to dig in and investigate themselves. 
Up and Vanished presents several theories, partly via a private investigator hired by Miller's family. They also share a strange accidental 911 call from somebody close to Nip. While all tips to the OSBI continue to be welcome, Love County's new sheriff declined to be interviewed by Up and Vanished, and it's unclear whether solving the case is priority today. Mm-mm-mm-mm. How terrible. Um, they are on Unsolved Mysteries. They are on... I mean, I, you name it. They're... Okay, so February... Let me see this. Here. Is one. Um, it started to play without us for a second there. Let me pull it back and I'll grab you. There are a lot of, of places to find information on them that I think that it's worth watching. I think it's really sad. Um, I believe last year they officially, was it last year? I'll look for you. They officially ruled her as deceased officially. Yeah. Molly Miller is missing. She was last seen nearly eight years ago. The circumstances of her disappearance center around a brief encounter with police. Two Works for You's Vincent Hill brings us one of Oklahoma's cold case files, The Mystery of Molly Miller. Olive Fielder kneels at the altar, praying to see her cousin Molly again. It's a nightmare you can't wake up from. The last time anyone saw Molly, she was inside this car along with two other people. But right now, only one person is accounted for. It's taken a toll on our entire family. Paula was much older than Molly, but their relationship, strong. She was real feisty, you know, and uh, she she just liked to play around. She was kind of a goofball, you know. Paula says Molly looked toward a bright future. She was very active in softball, and, um, and I really think that she could have been somebody someday uh, with her career. Paula and Molly caught up at a family reunion in 2013. She had poison ivy, terrible that day and it was hot so she spent a lot of her time inside um under the air conditioner that was the last time paula ever saw molly fast forward to july of 2013 and remember that car on july the 7th um it was on a sunday um she had been picked up her and colt had been picked up by con nip molly and her friend colt haynes were passengers the driver con nip leading police on a high-speed chase Police recordings show the car reaching speeds of over 100 miles per hour before officers lost sight of it in a wooded area. He freaking went out on a dirt road and they lost him. And that's where things take a strange turn. At 12.57 a.m., Molly made a 911 call. It was five seconds. Um, according to uh, dispatch, all they heard on the other end was just buttons being pushed. That trail in the woods stops here. You know, she made that last phone call at 9.33 a.m. and then 9.39, 9.39 was the last phone call made from her phone. Con Nip was arrested and sent to prison for fleeing from police, but he gave no indication of Molly's or Colt's whereabouts. The OSBI picked up the case in 2014, but have no leads in the case. So seven years after Molly's disappearance, her family made a difficult decision. She was declared deceased. Um, on January 13th of this year. The family not knowing what happened to Molly. Molly's grandpa, who she was very, very close to, died of COVID. I'm heartbroken that he did not get to see justice on this earth, but I'm also at peace with it because I know that he's with her now. Just days after Molly was declared deceased, search crews combed the area of her last known whereabouts in a sign of hope as a search dog alerted. <laughs> but it quickly faded when no traces of Molly were found. Meanwhile, Paula is praying for answers. I wish I could turn back time and bring her back and just tell her that I love her. If you have any information about the disappearance of Molly Miller on July 7th, 2013, please call the OSBI tip line at 1-800-522-8017. Vincent Hill, two works for you. Now, you're too. Sad, right? Isn't that so sad? 
Could you imagine having to declare your family member deceased? Ah, oh, I couldn't. Oh, it would be awful. It would be awful. And you don't really truly know. You don't truly know. <sighs> yeah. So that's what's going on with them. Um, yeah, it's not good. They're still trying to find them. Even even declared deceased, you still want their body. You still want them, right? So they're still missing. And um, if anybody knows anything, they're asked to contact the, the local law enforcement and, or 911. Um, and then also this right here, I talked about um, yesterday or the day before. Uh, this is a mother here in the center. And uh, it's the daughter on the, both sides. It's the same daughter just two pictures of her, um, and they were missing, right? And uh, unfortunately, we have bad news. Sorry. I had a yawn coming. I was trying to fight it so hard, but I couldn't fight it. I just kept, like, sitting there. I was like, oh, I just got to give in. Um, so, unfortunately, um, they were found, and they were found deceased, um, an, Ida an Idaho woman and her teen daughter with special needs who had not been seen since leaving for a camping trip on June 30th had been found dead from an apparent murder-suicide. Donna Rowe, 52, and Gabrielle Rowe, 16, were last seen in their van headed west on Interstate 84 near Fruitland, as Crime Online had previously reported. Um... Caldwell, Idaho, Police Chief Rex Ingram told KTVB that the pair were found dead in Oregon. 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 Preliminary information shows that it appears to be a murder-suicide by gunshot, Ingram said. In a statement on Facebook, the department said simply that, quote, Gabby and Donna have been located and their family notified. KTV. B said the bodies were found in Grant County, Oregon, whatever, where Grant County Sheriff Todd McKinley reported two bodies were found just inside the line with Harney County on public land near the town of Jersey, which is about 118 miles west of Caldwell. McKinley said that the van was found in a remote area by Sylvie's ranch employees early Thursday afternoon, according to the Elkhorn Media Group. The ranch hands saw one body in the vehicle and deputies found a second body concealed inside of the van. At the time, McKinley said names of the deceased were being withheld until notification of next of kin. And then... <clears throat> Other bit of information. It's only seven minutes long. But right here, there is a, a segment of the crime stories with Nancy Grace. Um, about, it says, missing autistic girl lured online disappears. I'm assuming that this is about Kaylee Jones. Um, I could be totally wrong. Uh, but if I were to just take a big wild guess, I'm going to come up with that. Let's see really quickly. 97% of smile active days and no changes to your routine. Brush your teeth for a wider, brighter smile. Don't wait. Order today and receive two twenty four ninety five plus free ship day money back guarantee. Visit smileacti. <laughs> A 16-year-old autistic girl vanishes from her own home in Georgia. Where is Kelly? I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thanks for being with us at Fox Nation and Sirius XM 111. First of all, take a listen to our friends at CBS 46. Yeah. Uh, so I weirdly have no... Hold on. I got to refresh this. There it is. Got it. There was no uh, address up in my address bar. I'm going to drop this for you. And if anybody would like the music scared you, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Sleuth Mom, one time your music scared me. 
uh, I had been sitting waiting for it to come on and I was off in La La Land doing something, you know, on the backside here of my own stuff. And you came on and your music gave me a jump. I was so scared. <sighs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, if anybody wants to hear that segment with Kaylee, um, again, I don't know how long it is because now she's about to have CBS talk or something she said. So it might just be the quick description about her. Um, I don't know how much information she's really going to get into it. But if you want it, it's there. And um, I put it in the comment section for you. So, um, yes, 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 yes. A scare for a scare. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I would never do that to you. I wouldn't do that to you on purpose, I promise. Um, but, uh, yeah, that music was quite loud and quite like... Dun, 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 dun. I'm like, ah, okay. Very demanding. Um, uh, so also, um, Thalia Torres, I may have covered her before, maybe, but I'm not sure. And I want to cover her again. Um, a, she is somebody that has connection to a family in our community. Right. And so, um, I do want to touch base if anybody knows anything or can pass it along, um, I can also drop this link too, if people want to share it. I also put it on my community wall and typed it out. Um, and so if you could share that out, that would be awesome. Um, but she went missing April 14th of this year from Green Bay, Wisconsin. And she is 17 years old, uh, biracial. She has brown hair, blue eyes. She's five foot two, 140 pounds. And, um, that's, it, aside from her being white and Hispanic, there isn't much else that could be found on her. Um, there wasn't, you know, there was another site, but the, the site took you to this site. Um, and so it's just really important to get her picture out there. And that way, if anybody sees her, they know that she is considered missing and to contact a uh, local authority, you could contact Green Bay Department Wisconsin at 920-448-3208 or 1-800-THE-LOST, which is 1-800-843-5678 or 911. But I wanted to make sure to cover that for sure tonight. Um, and then we have another missing that I want to touch base on. I've been watching it from a distance and I've not said anything. And I, I have just been seeing what's been going on with it. But um, I'm going to mention it because who really knows where they're at and what they're doing and what's going on with this family. Uh, well, it's not really a family is the thing about it. They're, they're exes. They're not together. Um, but I'll play this for you. So it says that um, say that a family they've been searching for was spotted again. Um, the thing about it is they're not together. They're, they aren't exactly a family. Now that is their daughter. That's their child. Yes. Yes, it is for sure. And those are her parents. But when it comes to these two being together, they are not together. And he randomly basically asked, Hey, want to go camping? Want to come with me to go camping? And her family tried their everything to advise her. And they probably feel like they didn't even do enough. But they tried to advise her to not go. To please don't think it's a good idea. I don't think you should go with them. She said, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It's going to be okay. You'll see. And uh, they were supposed to be back by the 30th of June. And they have not. And no, they didn't find them. Mm -mm. They thought that they spotted them, but it wasn't them. Yeah. Um, so they, um, <clears throat> here, I'll play this first one for you and I'll get into it. But she was supposed to be back on the 30th of June. It didn't end up coming back. And she was supposed to be meeting up with her 10-year-old son. And so the family said that 
if you want to talk about strange uh, behavior, she wouldn't have decided to extend her camping trip if that's what people want to insinuate because she would have never missed her visit with her son, right? To a developing story now, Sanford police say a family they've been searching for for more than a week was spotted again. CBS 13's Mel Myers live in the Sanford Police Department. And Mel, what are you learning about the search? Yeah, the Sanford police have been looking far and wide for this family, which includes a two-year-old child. Authorities now say that the family was spotted buying food at a Walmart on Friday. Where they went after that is still unknown. Police are trying to find Jill Sidebotham, two-year-old Lydia Hansen, and Nicholas Hansen. The group was last known to be headed to the Phillips area for camping, which is about two and a half hours north of Sanford. They were due back in southern Maine last Thursday, but police say family members grew worried after not hearing from them, which is how law enforcement got involved. After a few days without any confirmed sightings, the group was last seen on surveillance video at an undisclosed Walmart. At this point, it's not considered necessarily suspicious. It's just unusual. It's unusual, and yeah, and, it, and it's just you know concerning for the family. And if they're concerned, then then we want to pay attention to that. Also adding to this that a child is involved. But at this point, authorities still have no reason to believe foul play is involved or that this is a criminal matter. There's a lot of unknowns, including if the group is intentionally or unintentionally avoiding contact. The family was last seen driving a silver 2005 VW Jetta with the main registration plate 1563VJ. It has a black rear bumper. Police say if you can snap a photo or video of a potential sighting, that could help with their investigation. A sighting is great, but until we can actually validate that it, it is them or it is that vehicle, you know, that's where we can have another jump off point to maybe check, you know, more detailed area and maybe in those areas. Now, the Sanford Police Department is working with a number of other agencies to follow up on tips. But again, that last confirmed sighting was now nearly a week ago. Reporting live in Sanford, Melmire, CBS 13 News. Jen? Mel, thank you so much. New at 6, there is a new addition to the life. So that one was on the 7th, right? The one that I just showed you was on the 7th then the next one i'm going to show you here we're working you through the days up to today this here is on the 8th that they put this out they're trying to solve a mystery tonight they're trying to locate a two-year-old girl and her parents jill sidebotham and nicholas hansen and their daughter, Lydia Hansen, left on a camping trip from their Sanford home on June 27th. Now, the family was expected to return on June 30th, and the trio was reported missing on July 2nd. That's the same day that they were spotted on surveillance video in Mexico, Maine. Sidebotham and Hansen resided separately with the little girl living with the mom. At this point, police do not suspect any foul play. They just want to make sure that everyone is okay. My dog's the best, but he's not the greatest with other animals. What is new with you? Right. <clears throat> okay. Then the next. So, people can get a free ah. Samsung. Why do they always want to do that? They love it. They love to just play stuff. All right. The next one we have is on the 8th as well. Right. And it's reading. Hey, Ramblin, how are you? So, <clears throat> what a cute little child, by the way. Very adorable. So, it speaks that uh, for over a week after going camping was recently spotted oh a meat couple considered missing for over a week after going camping was recently spotted at a local walmart police said friday urging the public to continue to help in finding them police are looking for jill her two-year-old daughter lydia and nicholas whom 
family have told News Center Mean is her ex boyfriend. They were last seen at a Walmart in Mexico, Maine on Saturday around 4 p.m., the Sanford police said. The trio is believed to have been camping in the Phillips area in Franklin County around the time of their disappearance. At this time, we are attempting to locate them to check their well-being. We have no indication that the family is in danger, but out of caution, we would like to locate them, Sanford police said in a statement. The family was last seen driving a 2005 Volkswagen Jetta with a black rear bumper and the main license plate 1563VJ in the Rumford area, police have previously said. Jill last contacted her family on June 28th, who told News Center Main she was supposed to return home from the trip two days later. The Sanford Police Department is seeking tips and sightings and urging anyone who does see the three missing people to contact local police right away. I think there's something going on. All right. Next, I'm going to read to you. This is today, right? So let me bring you over here and put you on today's. And I, I appreciate that they cover up the child. That's nice of them, right? The little baby doesn't have any clothes on. Put some clothes on, baby. That's nice. That's good. All right. <clears throat> a two-year-old and her parents are missing after they failed to return from a camping trip in Maine, prompting fears about their safety and the pleas for the public's help for information, Fox 23 reports. Police say that 28-year-old Jill, 38-year-old Nicholas, and their two-year-old daughter, Lydia, were expected to return from the trip by June 30th, but thus far, they haven't. Jill's mother reportedly said that she was first concerned about the trip because Haynes, which would be Nicholas, right, unexpectedly showed up and asked her daughter to join him camping. Jill and Haynes are separated, and she and the two-year-old girl live with her parents in Sanford, Maine. My quote, my wife said that she tried to stop her. But Jill said that it would be fine, Ron told the Global uh, Boston Globe. Jill was supposed to spend time with her 10-year-old son on June 30th, and the fact that she didn't show up for the visit is unfathomable, according to Jill. I don't know if I added extra letters to that, unfathomable, unfathomable. <laughs> I think I did a bubble twice, but you know what I mean. Um... Haynes and Jill and their daughter were reportedly planning to camp near Phillips, Maine, about 130 miles north of Sanford. Chris Martin, Nicholas Haynes' sister, told The Globe that she was concerned upon learning that her brother had gone missing with his daughter and ex-girlfriend. Quote, I'm kind of losing hope that they're going to find them, Martin told The Globe. Quote, I wish somebody would say something. Somebody's got to know something. I worry that there's a two-year-old out there alone. And I'll play this in a moment. If that's a video connected to this. Corey Alexander, Jill's fiance, described her as a devoted mother and partner. He said he realized something was amiss when she stopped responding to his text messages. Whoa. Quote, we had plans for the weekend, Alexander told the Globe. We were going to do stuff with the kids for the 4th, and we were just going to have a nice long weekend together. And then Friday came around, and I realized she wasn't answering me. I knew something was wrong. Something in my gut was just telling me that this isn't right. Alexander added, quote, her phone has been off since last Wednesday. I've been devastated ever since she didn't answer. It's tearing me apart. I want them both home. I want them home so that we can get married. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. I love her more than anything. Huh. Investigators say neither Jill nor Hanson's phone have received or sent signals since late June. Jill's phone was most recently active on June 28th, while Hanson's phone ended communication on June 29th. Well, that doesn't make any sense, but okay. 
That doesn't make any sense, but authorities have determined that the parents and a girl visited a Walmart in Mexico, Maine on July 2nd, where they purchased food. Security camera footage does not appear to show anything concerning, according to a Facebook post from the Sanford Police Department. Police believe the trio are traveling in a silver 2005 Volkswagen Jetta with Maine license plate number 1563VJ. The vehicle has a black rear bumper. Investigators told WGME-TV they have no reason to suspect foul play or that a crime has occurred. However, Rita Lehman, Jill's sister, wrote a Facebook post that she is concerned for her sister's safety. Jill was last seen with my niece's father, who is not a stable person, she wrote on a Facebook post. He's not okay and has been violent before, especially when he thought somebody was taking Jill away. Ron, the father, um, Jill's father, has similarly raised fears that his daughter's absence may not be voluntary. And so I'm going to click on this. The father said... Her father, Jill's father, said, Quick update on Jill and Lydia. This is yesterday. A group of people went out to the Franklin County area to ask around campgrounds, stores, and people in general about seeing them. Flyers are passed out everywhere, including trail riders, trails riders on their side by sides. A few people believed that they may have seen them, but weren't positive. So as much as I wish I had some good news to post, they are still missing. Thank you to family friends who are family to us and always have been and the thousand of souls out there I have never met for all the help, love, and support. I hope the next update will be a positive one. Love you all, Ron, Cotty, and Brayden. Here is a missing flyer for Jill and Lydia. Please, anybody, it's been days, and it's not Jill's nature at all to just disappear. Please, everybody, if anybody sees her and my granddaughter, let Sanford PD know. We're so very worried for the two of them. We feel broken. Ugh. Sanford police search for a missing family of three. He put that out July 3rd. He put this out July 3rd, seeking public's help in locating this family. He put this on July 2nd. Uh, by the Rita. Hey guys, kind of worried right now because my sister has been missing since Wednesday. She's got a little two, two year old niece with her and no one seems to know where they went. We're seriously worried. She won't take off like this and stay radio silent for so long, especially with her son waiting for her. If you see Joe, please, please, please let us know. Edit. She was last with my niece's father, who is not a stable person. If you do see them, be careful of him. He's not okay and has been violent before, especially when he thought someone was taking Jill away. Oh, there is that post. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Um... Somebody said, um, he wrote back, they said, I'm glad this is public. Please have them contact South Arm Campground, the roads off of South Arm Road. There are many spots of the road towards wherever that, that he could camp out. Just curious as to why she hasn't reached out to somebody, at least to let you not worry. And he said, there's reason to believe he's holding her against her will. We don't know 100%, but it's a great possibility. Wow. And he put that a day ago. She And he said, thank you for the information. And she said, you're very welcome. I'm so sorry your family is ever, is even having to go through this action. Surely speak louder of what you think. I tagged a few that live up that way. 
One actually works in the woods all around the area. We have friends that run dogs um, there too. And I tagged who would be. I'll pray that she and her little stay safe from any harm. He said, same thoughts as you. Also, anywhere along the whatever track and over on number six road up towards Byron. By Byron. Byron. <laughs> Byron. So, that was yesterday's. Wow. Um, are you guys on this with me? No, you're not. You're over in Neverland. Where are you guys? I don't even... It says you're on this. Where are you? Are you with me? Yeah, you're with me. Hey, kitties. What are we doing? Moon? Money, what you doing? So... And we know what the sister had said now. I'm trying to find my back. Yeah, so that's the update on the family right now. They are still missing. All good? Okay. <laughs> so that's the update on that, that little little girl and her two parents. Um, that they did get a report that they had been seen supposedly at a Walmart but uh, and buying food, right? But they didn't get to talk to them or stop them or have any interaction with them. It was just a sighting. And then they watched like camera footage back, but they didn't get to actually talk to them. Unfortunately. Um, also, if anybody cares about Johnny Depp stuff um, or Amber Heard, I see on the side here of what I'm looking at, it says Amber Heard asked court to declare a mistrial on Johnny Depp defamation case over issue with a juror. Uh, so... There's that information. And I'm going to bring you over here. Onto this. Um, this was a missing man. I'd spoken with his older brother earlier today, Curtis, who described him as an avid outdoorsman. Right now, police say the death does not appear to be suspicious, but the medical examiner is investigating the cause. 27-year-old Jesse Lane was first reported missing yesterday after growing concerns with when his car was found in an unusual spot on a trail in Bow. Family members tell me they had last heard from him on July 2nd. It was unlike him not to keep in touch. Several agencies searched last night and all day today before ultimately finding him in this wooded area. And again, right now, the cause of death is under investigation. We're live in Bow. I'm Hannah Cotter, WMUR News 9. Uh, sad. Sad, 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 sad. All right. So this one that I'm putting you on, I showed it to you yesterday. I believe. Yeah, yesterday's date. They've updated. No, this is the one I showed you yesterday. I want to read to you what it said. Um, I don't remember what the part was I wanted you to see, though. Exactly. <clears throat> Federal judge determined that the suspect in Dylan Round's disappearance was a danger to the community and a flight risk Friday after he pleaded not guilty to an unrelated felony charge at the United States Federal Courthouse at Salt, at Salt Lake City. James Brenner wore a blue Weber, Weber uh, County outfit chains as he faced charge of being a felon in possession of a firearm. He does not face charges related to the missing person case. Round's family members sat in the courtroom not far from Brenner as attorney attorneys argued. Here we go. That's why. Okay. Over whether he should be released. The U.S. prosecutor, listen to this, recounted when he called Brenner's uh, violent and atrocious history, which included a malicious shooting in 1986 convictions for illegally transporting and possessing a firearm and a pending aggravated assault charge where he uh, is accused of beating a 70 year old man with an aluminum chair yeah yeah brenner's attorney pushed back against the characterization of his criminal history, arguing that he is not a danger to the public or a flight risk and pointing to Brenner's compliance with court conditions in the past. The judge ultimately sided with the prosecution, saying 
quote, there are no conditions under which the defendant could be released, citing safety concerns, a pattern of criminal activity, and a lack of family in the area. Brenner will now be held in U.S. custody until his trial in September. Brenner, uh, okay, this is uh, updates that were given. Uh, that's a relief knowing that he's not going to get out. They're holding him, said Candace. It's good to see Brenner in shackles. And hearing the judge's decision were, was a little bit of weight off my shoulders. Stark contrast from the scene of Cooley has grown used to over the last six weeks in the vast remote desert near Nevada border where her son went missing. Until we know, it's hard. I mean, you have emotion, but we need to know. Then we can move forward. Cooley said Brenner used to live in a trailer on the family's property and that he had worked with Rounds off and on in the past. Authorities say Brenner was squatting in a trailer and was Rounds' closest neighbor when he went missing from the farm in Lucen. Rounds just said Brenner was a crazy old man who lived out in the desert, Cooley said. That's what you'd expect from any 17-year-old kid at that time. According to the complaint against Brenner in the days after Round went missing, after investigators interviewed Brenner, a friend and neighbor told authorities that Brenner brought him three muzzle loaders and a rifle and asked him to keep them safe. When the friend asked why, Brenner stated that he needed to do this for his own safety and the last time he had trouble with the law, they took everything from him and he did not want the things that he had left to be taken again. I think James did something to him. I think he snapped, especially hearing more of what I hear in courts, Cooley said. Everything's led us right back to where Rounds parked that green truck and where his boots were found. Everything's taken us right back to the day one. The sheriff's office declined to talk to KSL about where Rounds' boots were found, but Cooley said in their search of the area, they found his boots behind Brenner's trailer. Investigators have since taken them in as evidence. Brenner does not face any charges related to Rounds' disappearance. The Box Elder County Sheriff's Office named him a suspect earlier this week, and officials say that they are still actively building their case. That's going to be the key. Our key. That's what we need. Somebody to talk, Cooley said. We're getting some stuff moving forward, and you know, keep looking forward to getting the answers and being able to bring Dylan home. Right? And then, let me see how big this... Alright. Then, we have this. Something I believe that Brenner is unable to bail out. Yeah, he's not here. Okay. Full docket. Um... Minute entry for proceeding held before Judge Magistrate Judge Brooks Wells. Initial appearance arraignment pre-trial conference uh, detention hearing. James Brenner. One count, uh, count one held on July 8th, 2022. Defendant was present in person and in custody. The defendant waives formal reading of the indictment. Rights and penalties explained the defendant enters a plea of not guilty. The government makes an oral motion for a protective order. The court grants the motion for a protective order. Written motion and order from government to follow. Which I have that I'm going to read to you guys. The written motion and order from the government. Um, the government seeks detention. The court hears from counsel. The court orders the defendant detained and remanded to the USMS pending resolution of this matter. Discovery due by 7-11, so July 11th. Motions will be due by August 1st. The plea agreement will be due by August 22nd. Proposed jury instructions along with proposed voir dire questions will be September 9th and a three-day jury trial is set for September 12th at 8 30 a.m 
in the judges chambers before judge tina campbell attorney for the plaintiff is carlos esquada esquada attorney for the defendant is tessa hansen um etc there's no need for an interpreter probation officer is morgan wallen court reporter electronic and then they did the time time date room number all that right so let me take you over here Do, 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 do. This is supposed to be new today. The video is not new. I know that. The video is not new. So let's read the article. Salt Lake City, James Brenner was painted as a violent man who shouldn't be released from jail. Brenner was named a suspect by authorities for the disappearance of Dylan Rounds. The 19-year-old disappeared in late May and has not been heard from since. Friday, Brenner appeared in federal court on firearms violation. He pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. There was no mention of Brenner being tied to Dylan's disappearance. But it gave the public a glimpse of what Brenner is like. Quote, he was either squatting on Dylan's property or at the property adjacent to Dylan's, and he had no right to be there, said Deputy U.S. Attorney Carlos Esquata. According to Dylan's mother, Brenner often helped her son at the farm. In fact, she said Dylan's boots were found near where Brenner was staying on his prop son's on her son's property. Quote, it looked like they were just tossed out there, she said. Brenner, the main suspect in Dylan's disappearance, and there's a $100,000 reward offer for his whereabouts. But Cooley said no one's coming forward with information and claimed that speaks volumes. If you offer somebody $100,000 and we've gotten nothing, she said. She acknowledges that the key to solving Dylan's disappearance is with Brenner. He has the answers, she said. During Brenner's detention hearing, prosecutors said that he is a danger to the community and should not be back out on the streets. He currently has an outstanding warrant from Box Elder County, where he allegedly peed up a man using a lawn chair, and he also served time for attempted murder. Oh, he has a lengthy history of violence, said Esquada. He had a shootout before. He has a history of shooting at people, and despite that, he's a convicted felon. He continues to carry firearms. Brenner's attorney, Tessa Hansen, said the attempted murder in Maryland happened 30 years ago, and the charge was dropped to malicious shooting. She said, I wondered, huh. She said he had two gun violations over the past 30 years. Yeah! Right, that's too, too many. Hansen said she was unaware of the outstanding warrant in Box Elder. Well, do your research, sweetie. He's your defendant. He's your he's your client, I mean. You're supposed to be the, the, the his defense. You better do your research on him. After hearing of his criminal past, Dylan's mother was even more convinced that Brenner was more than a suspect. I think James did something to him, she said. I think that he snapped, and especially hearing more of it in court. Brenner was denied bail and returned to Weber County Jail. His trial was set for September, but he will return to state court Monday in Box Elder County, where he is facing more gun violations. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that one. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. And then you've got the order granting motion for protective order. Let me put you on it. Oh, my kitty's got something to say. Order granting motion for protective order, District of Utah, based upon the United States motion for protective order, its stipulation of the parties, the court hereby finds that a protective order is necessary and appropriate, in this case, to prevent harmful disclosure of the personal identifying information of various individuals, 
while still preserving the defendant's right to a fair trial and meaningful discovery pursuant to the court's authority under federal rule of criminal procedure 16 d1 it is hereby ordered one that the united states provide the defendant unredacted copies of the discovery in this matter including documents that contain the personal identifying information of third parties two the unredacted documents related to the personal ident identifiers of witnesses shall be produced to the defendant pursuant to this order shall not be disclosed or made available for inspection or copying to any person other than as permitted in paragraph three unredacted documents provided to the defendant pursuant to this order may be my cat yelling over me let me go to the next page for you because boy does my cat got something to talk about further disclosed to the following people a counsel for the defendant b associates uh i don't know what that is paralegals private investigators forensic accountants and other employees or independent contractors of such attorney to the extent necessary to render professional services in this criminal prosecution and <clears throat> and a court officials involved in this case for the defendant and counsel stipulate to the protective order copies of the un redacted discovery pertaining to the personal identifiers of the witnesses shall not be provided to the defendant nor will the defendant be allowed to make handwritten copies of this portion of the discovery redacted copies of the discovery can be provided by counsel to the defendant five persons obtaining access to the document produced pursuant to this order shall use the information only for the preparation preparation and conduct of this criminal trial and any connected hearings or appeals no information disclosed pursuant to this order shall be used for any other purpose or any other proceeding six within 90 days of the conclusion of this case all documents produced pursuant to this order and all copies thereof other than exhibits of the court shall be returned to the united states attorney office alternatively counsel for the defendant may inform the united states attorney office in writing that all such copies have been destroyed counsel for the defendant huh, is responsible for employing reasonable measures to control duplication of and access to the unredacted discovery documents wow and number eight the provisions of this order governing disclosure and use of the documents shall not terminate at the conclusion of this criminal prosecution yeah so that's one right that's the um order granting motion for protective order then there is the government motion uh motion for protective order right let me open these up uh open let me grab you for this one yeah wowie okay district of utah united states district court uh james brenner united states of america versus james brenner motion for protective order the united states of america by and through assistant united states attorney carlos 
Esquata, and by stipulation of counsel, respectfully request that court to enter the following protective order in this case. The United States Attorney obtained an indictment on July 6, 2022, that alleges the defendant committed felon in possession of a firearm. In the course of the United States investigation, it has obtained statements and evidence from the witnesses that contains personal information and identifiers, which should remain confidential. The information sought to be protected in this motion is exclusive to the personal identifiers. Let me get you the next one. Of the witnesses, here and after material, all other materials are subject to disclosure, disclosure without redaction. Two, the United States intends to produce this material in discovery to the defense. All materials that the United States produces to the defense are solely for the use of the defendant, their representative, or no, their respective attorney, or other individuals or entities acting within the attorney-client relationship to prepare for the trial in this case. The purpose of this protective order is to prevent the unauthorized dissemination, distribute, distribution, or use of materials containing the personal information of others. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They already know where this is going to go. So, I mean, oh, can I zoom it? Yeah. Uh, the defendant and his attorney and all other individuals or entities who receive materials in this case are prohibited from directly or indirectly providing access to or otherwise disclosing the contents of the, these materials to anyone not working on the defense of this criminal case or otherwise making use of the materials in a manner unrelated to the defense of this criminal case. Authorized use of materials related to the defense of this criminal case shall include showing and discussing such materials with the United States and defense witnesses. Number four, defendant, his respective attorney, and all other individuals or entities who receive materials in this case shall maintain all materials received from the United States in a manner consistent with the terms of this protective order. Materials produced to the defense shall be stored in a secure manner by defense counsel in boxes, files, or folders marked, quote, under protective order, do not disclose electronic materials. produced to the defense and printouts obtained from electronic materials shall be handled in the same manner. Five, defendant and his attorney are required to give a copy of this protective order to all individuals or entities engaged or consulted by defense counsel in preparation of trial in this case. A knowing and willful violation of this protective order by the defendant, his attorney, or others may result in contempt of court proceeding or other civil or criminal sanctions. Six, within 90 days of the conclusion of this case, including all related appeals, all document produced pursuant to this protective order, and all copies thereof other than exhibits of the court shall be destroyed and the defendant's attorney shall inform the United States office in writing that all such copies have been destroyed. Seven, the defendant James Brenner and counsel stipulate to the protective order. Counsel and defendant further agree that copies of the unredacted discovery pertaining to the personal identifiers materials will not be provided to the defendant nor will the defendant be allowed to make handwritten copies of the unrelated discovery pertaining to the personal identifiers and materials. However, redacted discovery may be provided to the defendant along with all other unredacted discovery unrelated to the personal identifiers. 
and oh what did i just do that for please hold what did i just do yeah okay and then It's such a quick one. I thought it was a repeat, but it's not. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. And number eight, the provisions of this order governing disclosure and use of the documents shall not terminate at the conclusion of this criminal prosecution dated this eighth day of July, 2022. So they finally did get get it yesterday they did it um and so this is all the stuff that they requested and the one that i just read to you prior to this was what they got was their official what they got oh i was in the middle of reading you have to dip you gotta go goodbye she okay bye <laughs> thank you glad you said bye sissy honey sissy hello I know it. You just went to the bathroom. Oh, my Lanta. She's got to let everybody know about it. Big story. Big story for everybody. She's got news to share to everyone. All right. Let me put you on this. This is uh, some the footage that they put out about the rescue squad. It marks one year since Summer Wells went missing from her Hawkins County home. Investigators are still working to find any clues into her disappearance. An Amber Alert is still active this morning. Her parents, John and Candace, claim someone kidnapped her. No, this from looks their old. The Beach Creek area, but law enforcement say that they have no evidence to support that claim. In a year, the TBI received more than 2,000 tips, and none of them have led to Summer. And while you were sleeping overnight, Don Wells, Summer's father, released. A statement from jail where he's serving time for a DUI. He says since she went missing, he's been devastated. The statement goes on to say he hopes YouTube would be the most powerful tool in helping to find her. Search crews have combed the Hawkins County area searching for summer in October and in exclusive interview, Don Wells showed us where he says the kidnappers took his daughter. I think Whoever grabbed her probably had her mouth covered, and uh, I think she was gasping for air by the time she got down through here somewhere because our neighbor heard a scream, a really funny scream. I think I just carried her to a vehicle and threw her in there and took her somewhere far away from here. We do have a full timeline of the events since last year right now in the WVLT News app. If you know anything, call 1-800-TBI-FIND. Okay, then the video itself was not new. However, it's dated the 7th, so it's got to be just the writing then that's new. And this documentation, that's what they wanted to put out, was the documents, which we already got. We already got that. Um, Churchill Rescue Squad officials filed a court petition on June 30th asking to halt donations to an ongoing reward fund for tips into the ongoing search for missing Hawkins County six-year-old Summer Wells. The CHRS also asked the Hawkins County Chancery Court, I guess, to take over uh, the future of the reward fund after issuing, after issues arose about a portion of the money donated. The petition said that in October and November of 2021, a woman named Q Carlock deposited over 32000 into the account via wire transfer. Shortly after the donation, the CHRS got an email from a woman known as Fiona O'Connor, who said that she was an independent investigator that took issue with the donation. O'Connor said in the email that the money may have been raised through an illegal fundraiser through YouTube. The true identity of both defendants... Um, are questionable. The petition states defendant 
Fiona O'Connor shows an address of United Kingdom. However, an internet search reveals numerous persons having the same name in multiple locations of the UK. Defendant Cute Carlock search reveals uh address and doesn't matter where and however such a an internet search also revealed multiple similar names outside of tennessee while the fund was accepting donation um people could give money through civis bank however the petition said that the bank did not make any record of deposits into the account CHRS official said the total for the reward fund was $73,705.90. And I'll put you on to this one. And this should, this is also dated to be new. New this morning, controversy over the reward fund for Summer Wells, that missing East Tennessee little girl. Channel 5's Nick Barris is in the Five Alert Center, and Nick Summer has been missing now for more than a year. Uh, that's right, Amy. You know, in that time, thousands and thousands of dollars have been raised for the reward fund. The question is, what is going to happen with all of that money and who will be the steward of it? And that is the uh, object of a case that's gone before a judge. A rescue squad is asking a court to freeze the donations and take control of the fund because there are some questions about how all of that money was raised, okay? How it will be used moving forward. Now, there is more than $74,000 in the reward fund for Summer Wells. The rescue squad wants the court now to take control of the fund to handle the money just to make sure moving forward, it's all handled properly. Of course, you have to keep in mind, no money has been paid out because there have been no tips yet that have come forward that have led to Summer Wells. So in the meantime, what happens with all the money? It's not also, by the way, exactly clear what will happen with all that money if she is never found. So more to come on. And we read the entire investigation, the, the whole, everything that's happening with the bank, right? A uh, couple streams, what now? Um, four streams ago, maybe? Three? Two? I don't remember how long it's been. I don't know. Uh, I think this is quite funny. This is quite funny to me. The simple bare necessities Forget about your worries and your strife I mean the bare necessities Old oh, Mother Nature's recipes That bring the bare necessities He's the simple bare necessities He literally thinks it's another bear Gets so scared And then he goes to fight it for a moment and then realizes this is a dang on this is stupid <laughs> oh my gosh it's so funny i laughed good and hard about this earlier i'm not gonna lie i had a good laugh about it when he looks at both right there i i can't oh man too too funny <laughs> gosh i cannot handle it he was so mad about it too he was so ready to fight and was so ready he went at it rawr, and then he was like wait a minute what this is stupid <laughs> oh it's so funny uh everyone i appreciate you being here thank you so much thank you thank you and i will see you all come tomorrow have an awesome night